Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Mini Tribes One Kingdom. It's your good buddy John here with today's video. We will be doing another cautionary tale on King Jeroboam, so I hope you're excited for that. If you don't know who that is, stick around and find out. But before we start, if you're new, I would really appreciate it if you would hit that subscribe button if you enjoy videos about the Bible or Christianity. And if you're a returning subscriber, welcome back. Thanks for spending just a little bit of time with us. All right, let's get right into this. So Jeroboam is king of Israel, and we will find his story in 1 Kings chapters 11 through 14. So I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible, and we'll just get right into it. Then Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of, Zer of Zerida, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zerua, a widow, also rebelled against the king. Now this was the reason why he rebelled against the king. Solomon built the Milo and closed up the breach of the city of his father David. Now the man Jeroboam was a valiant warrior, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he appointed him over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. It came about at that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak, which was on him, and tore it into twelve pieces. He said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and give you ten tribes, but he will have one tribe, for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me, and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Kamash, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and observing my statutes and my ordinances, as his father David did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life, for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give it to you, even ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. I will take you, and you shall reign over whatever you desire, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you, and walk in my ways, and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. Thus I will afflict the descendants of David for this, but not always. Solomon sought therefore to, to put Jeroboam to death. But Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt. And he was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So things are starting off looking pretty good for Jeroboam. Solomon has fallen from God's grace. He has built many pagan idols and worshipped many pagan gods because of his wives. That's a story for a different day, though. So God has chosen a new person to rule over his people. Something to note is that Jeroboam must have started out as a pious man. Otherwise, God wouldn't have chosen him. So at some point in his life, Jeroboam must have been a God-fearing man. He's described as a great warrior and one of Solomon's top officials. He's someone the people would follow if he took over. So Ahijah explains the situation to Jeroboam, telling him what God has decided and laying it all out for him. But it seems Solomon doesn't like the sound of that because he tries to kill Jeroboam pretty quickly. And he should have learned from his father David that if God has decided to appoint him a new king, nothing you can do will stop him. So Jeroboam flees to Egypt. And let's take a look at how things go for Jeroboam. So we're skipping down a little bit in the verses, and it says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, 
Then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places, and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. Sorry. Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, even in the month which he had, dev which he had devised in his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel, and went up to the altar to burn incense. Now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. While Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense, he cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. Then he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes which are on it shall be poured out. Now when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! But his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes were poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given, by the word of the Lord. The king said to the man of God, Please entreat the Lord your God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and it became as it was before. <sighs> Drastic shift here. Whatever faith Jeroboam may have had is gone. Maybe his time hiding in Egypt changed him. Maybe he adopted the paganism of the Egyptians. Or maybe the fact that a supposed servant of God had actively tried to kill him. Maybe that changed him. No idea, and it's really not important. The important thing is Jeroboam is no longer a man of faith. So God's made him king over Israel because of Solomon's sin. He's taken the kingdom away from Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and put Jeroboam in charge. Now, apparently Jeroboam wasn't listening to Ahijah when he gave him the job because he immediately does the things God took the kingdom away from Solomon's family for doing. Remember, God took away the kingdom from Solomon because he made altars and idols that were not supposed to be there. He's so desperate to hold on to his power that he won't let the people go up to Jerusalem to worship the true God because he's afraid they, they'll want to reunite with Judah. He didn't listen to God's promise and was only thinking about himself. First off, God had promised to make him king. Regardless of anything else, he should have trusted God. If God said he was going to be king, he was going to be king. It didn't matter what the people tried to do. And on the other note... Ahijah had told Jeroboam that God would not be against the house of David forever. Should the day have come when a truly godly king ruled over Jerusalem and the people wanted to reunite, Jeroboam should have been the one championing that cause. He should have been the champion of that cause to reunite the kingdoms. But instead, he's only thinking about himself. He's not trusting God. He's not caring about God. And he doesn't care about God's plans. And so he builds not just one, but two golden calves in his kingdom for the people to worship. Now, on a side note, what is it with the Israelites and golden calves? Honestly, it seems like whenever they want to build an image, you know, whenever they want to break God's law, that's the one they go to. Let me know in the comments why you, got, why you might think that is. Anyway, 
because Jeroboam wants to keep the power he has, which was given to him by God, we should remember, he sets up a rival religious system to Jerusalem. And when the man of God confronts him, Jeroboam responds with violence, or at least he attempts to. Now, he gets a chance to see God's mercy firsthand, and no, no pun intended here. God heals his hand after disabling it, and seems to be giving Jeroboam another chance. Now, I do find it interesting that Jeroboam has fallen so far that he doesn't refer to God as the Lord my God. He calls him the Lord your God. Now, maybe I'm just reading too much into this. I don't know. Let's read what Jeroboam does with God's mercy. Maybe he'll change his ways. Maybe he turns around. Let's find out what scripture has to say. After this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil way, but again he made priests of the high places from among all the people, any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. This event became sin to the house of Jeroboam, even to blot it out and destroy it from off the face of the earth. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise now and disguise yourself so that they will not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam. And go to Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah the prophet is there, who spoke concerning me that I would be king over this people. Take ten loaves with you, some cakes, and a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will happen to the boy. Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning his, her son, for he is sick. You shall say thus and thus to her, for it will be when she arrives that she will pretend to be another woman. When Ahijah heard the sound of her feet coming in the doorway, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another woman? For I am sent to you with a harsh message. Go, say to Jeroboam, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel. Because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both, bo both bond and free in Israel. And I will make a, que a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And he who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens will eat. For the Lord has spoken it. Now you. Arise, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child will die. All Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave, because in him something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel, who will cut off the house of Jeroboam this day and from now on. For the Lord will strike Israel, as a reed is shaken in the water. And he will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers, and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River, because they have made their Asherim, provoking the Lord to anger. He will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam, which he committed, and with which he made Israel to sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arose, and departed, and came to Terzah. As she was entering the threshold of the house, the child died. All Israel buried him and mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant Ahijah the prophet. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. The time that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. Look, you read the title of the video when you clicked on it. You knew how this was going to end. You knew Jeroboam didn't take the second chance that God gave him. In fact, as soon as his hand is back to normal, 
he seems to go right back to his old ways. And then comes his last recorded act, trying to trick a blind prophet. Now, personally, I take this as an insult, and that's not just because Jeroboam thought he would be able to trick Ahijah just because he was blind from old age, although that does offend me, thank you very much. But because Jeroboam seemed to think he could go back to Ahijah and go back to God without confessing what he'd done. I honestly wonder what he actually thought was going to happen. Did he think Ahijah wouldn't catch on to some random woman showing up to ask about Jeroboam's son? Did he think God was as blind as Ahijah had become? I don't know. But here's what I do know. God warns Ahijah, and Jeroboam's sentence is pronounced. His son is going to die, but at least in peace, and he's going to be buried, because he at least was faithful to God. But as for Jeroboam and the rest of his family... They'll face God's punishment. The next king, Basha, he conducts a genocide against the house of Jeroboam. He kills every single one of them and leaves the bodies behind to be eaten by dogs and birds. And that's how Jeroboam's life ends. So what's significant about Jeroboam's story? He starts out so promising. He's a strong warrior and someone the people can trust. God chooses him to reign over his people, and he had a responsibility to reign righteously, but instead he was more concerned with keeping his political power, keeping his own image. So he builds altars and idols to keep the people away from Jerusalem and away from God. He's given chances by God to turn back to him and renounce his sins, but he doesn't seem interested. Instead, he does even worse. He tries to trick a blind prophet, which is basically like trying to trick God. In the end, he has to watch his son die and knows his entire dynasty will fall after his death. And even worse, he leads the rest of Israel down the road with him. In fact, throughout the rest of the books of Kings, the evil kings are compared to Jeroboam and his sin. Whenever they do evil, it says they did evil after Jeroboam. So this starts the Israelites down the long road that leads them to Assyria and their captivity, all because of Jeroboam. Ultimately, the thing we can learn from Jeroboam's life is that we should never let our power go to our heads. Sometimes we have pastors and religious leaders who will do anything to keep their power. Instead, we need to trust God in everything we do. When the time comes to step aside or step down, we should do so. When the time comes for God to take over, let God take over. Don't think that you can do extra that God can't. Also, if God gives us another chance to repent, we should take it instead of throwing it back into his face like Jeroboam did. Ultimately, this is one of those tragedies. Jeroboam started out as such a promising figure. He could have been the next David, but instead he's even he's described as being worse than any king who came before him. So he's worse than Saul. He's worse than any of the judges. And ultimately, his life ends in disgrace. He ends as an enemy of God. And I shudder to think of what his punishment was. Now, again, I don't know for sure, but I feel like if he had repented, the Bible would have told us. So that's everything I have for you on the life of Jeroboam. Again, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on the golden calves down in the comment section. Why do you think Israel kept building them? Was it something special about the calves that Israel really wanted? I don't know. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or thoughts of your own about Jeroboam and his story, please let me know down in the comments. Please give this video a like and share it with everyone you can. We really are looking forward to spending more time with you guys and growing together in our faith in Jesus Christ. Have a great day. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and God bless you. Mm -hmm.